Well, I'm delighted to welcome Alison Hodge uh, in this particular video. Um, Alison is um, a highly experienced supervisor who's also done an, a lot of work in the team coaching area and is a team coach supervisor as well. Um, Alison has worked on me on some research in this area. Um, and what I've asked her to share with us today is her model of the, the environment for team coaching, uh, which I think is an extremely valuable way of just looking at the systems that surround the team coaching engagement. So Alison, thank you very much for, 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 for agreeing to present on this one. So what in your view, would you summarize to say makes a difference for you between team coaching and one-to-one -one coaching? Thank you, David. It's lovely to see you. Um, there are several aspects to this, I think, uh, the complexity of team coaching versus one-to-one. -one. Um, you mentioned the multiple layers, and perhaps my map will, will personify that. I think, um, unlike in many instances in one-to-one, -one, there is the individual coachee, possibly the line manager, and the coach. But in team coaching, of course, we have the coach or coaches, often they're working in dyads, going into an environment where there is a sponsor, there are multiple stakeholders, and let alone those, there are however many members of the ostensible team that may get involved, which could be anything from two to four to six to eight people. And as soon as we get into that zone, we're not just talking about coaching on a one-to-one -one in a group environment, there is a heck of a lot more that's going on simultaneously. We're often in an environment where the team is within multiple teams and or in a complex organizational environment or a complex market environment. I don't know, things like the financial services or like healthcare or like education. So these are factors that perhaps are more evident and in the system and the field when the coach comes in to do the work. I think the other question that I've noticed coming for coaches into supervision is the client may ask for team coaching, but doesn't quite necessarily have a clear view of what that might be, or they have one idea. And as this is a new field relatively, sometimes the coach may not have a clear framework or definition of what their notion of team coaching might look like. So we get the organizational client and the coach saying, well, we're going to do some work together and we're going to call it team coaching, but we might, do in, we might need to do a bit of consulting. We might need to do a bit of training input. We might need to do a bit of facilitation. And by the way, how developed is this team and what stage of development is it at? So is coaching the appropriate intervention or do we need to be putting stepping stones in before we get to a team coaching practice, if you like? So just in that, quick summary i i guess that uh, those are the things that come to mind when we talk about what is so different for the team coach i think the other important element is for many coaches who have worked as dedicated one-to-one -one practitioners they come into the team or group environment and are astounded astonished um, taken aback by the multiple factors that might be taken into account when they engage in this work. What is the contract? Who are they contracting with? How do they contract, given that there are all these different um, representatives within the environment that's going to be involved, that are going to be involved? So, so it was that complexity um, uh, multiple layers of complexity that led, that, that led you towards the model, I, I, I assume. So tell us a little, a little bit more about that journey. Okay, and I, I'm interested that we, are, we call it a model because in actual fact, I, this came about because of two, two or three areas. One is um, I love groups. 
So I'm fascinated by what goes on in groups. So I guess I've encouraged and attracted class supervisees to come and look at their group and their group facilitation and their teamwork. Um, another element of it is that I wanted to create less what we might call a model, which might be viewed as linear or sequential, but to create a map of all these multiple layers and ingredients or elements that the team coach may need to be mindful of or notice or be impacted by when they come into an assignment. And how do, how do I represent visually something a phenomenon or a phenomenological process that is in constant motion, constantly interacting with no one factor more predominant than another. And um, so it started with what a client's bringing, my passion in groups, how to create something visual as opposed to just talking about it, because how do we keep a how do, we, how do we create containment and manage all of this stuff that's going on that may at times appear messy? And I think another really important element for me is to acknowledge the work of Nora Bateson, who is the daughter of Gregory Bateson, who developed an approach in the field of relational systems called warm data. And she has done a lot of work around what can we learn from nature and the interconnectedness of the different elements in nature that inform and learn from each other to thrive, to flourish, to die off, to let go. Um, and I'm really struck by this notion of warm data, which sort of captures the, the livingness of it. Mm. So that it's not a, a dead static step-by-step -step process. It's pulsating, it's breathing, it's cohabiting with all the elements that have come about. And the metaphor I guess I've built on from her work of warm data is imagining the metaphor of going into a forest. So the team coach goes into a forest and we've got trees and we've got vines and we might have snakes and spiders and we might have the big sky cover and we might have rain and we might have humidity and we might have the stamina of the coach or their colleague or is anybody carrying the backpack when the coach goes in there. So there's something here about it. Um, how to how to capture that notion of of livingness and interconnectedness that enables the coach to appreciate and respect and have compassion for the level and layers that this work involves. Because so much, of course, in that analogy is hidden. We don't see the mycelium, uh, the, the connection to fungi and other <clears throat> and other roots that that that, that sustain the trees and all, and all the vegetation, or the ants that clear it all up. Yeah, yeah, so what's going on under the bark? Whoa. <laughs> um, so that's, I guess that's how, that's how this, I'm, I'm calling it a map. And the reason I call it a map, and that this is mapping the dynamics of team coaching, perhaps distinguishing it from a model, is so that, when we enter into it, we're coming with an exploratory inquiry rather than what are the steps I need to take. And there will be others like you, like Peter with GTCI and things that, that you will be developing a model of process that the coach can follow. But there's something about how does the coach bring themselves in a spirit of inquiry and curiosity and exploring to discover rather than I need to follow a particular pathway. Yeah, 
I would sometimes say when the, when the process takes over, it's not coaching. <laughs> and in the newness of this field, that's potentially what can happen at present, I imagine. So, um, yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure if now would be a time to show where I've got to with the map. I think it would be great to show it now. Yes, please. Okay, bear with me while we do a screen share. Oops, we've got to go. Hang on. I love all this multitasking. <laughs> okay, so now I go to there and then I go to there. Sorry, this is, I, I have to say it out loud there. So here we go. Now I have this as, as a, in a slide format so that it's easily accessible. How does that look for you? Yes, do you want to put it into slide view? I'm just seeing if I can. Mm. I'm not sure if I can. Slide show. Um, okay. Actually, that, that will probably do. I think that's that's as, that's as close as I can get it at the moment. Is that all yeah. right? That I think uh, that'll be fine. Thank you, Alison. There we go. How's that? Okay. So that looks good. Um, let me start. In actual fact, with putting why well, I, I put the coach or the coaches at the centre of this, and that's informed. I think one of the questions we were going to look at is. How do how do I get to be in have have created this this notion or this visual? Because um, these are when the coach comes to supervision, they're saying, "I don't know if I'm making any progress. I don't know whether I'm being effective. I want to add value. I don't know what's going on here. I'm not sure if I have any control, let alone some control." Um, so. In the concept of this dynamics and the and the mapping, I put the coach at the centre. So we start here, and I don't know whether you can see it if I put my cursor on there, can you? You can, yeah. Okay, so we start with the coach in the middle. And the sort of questions that we might look at um, for the coach themselves and in supervision is, um, what is their stage of practice development? How conscious are they of themselves and the impact they have? What's their coaching style and capability? What are their values and philosophy? Knowledge of adult learning. And very importantly for me is what are their own patterns when they come into group? Because, um, and one of the things that I think is fascinating to explore is our family of origin, how did, what did I learn? How did I learn to be in a group when I was growing up? And how does that inform how I show up? But equally then, we could go to the team and how are they showing up? Or we could go to the contracting that we make or the, the individual participants. How are they coming into the teamwork when they have patterns of being in a group and how does that inform how they participate or not? How they engage? Are they open or hesitant? Do they, are they nervous or not used to speaking up in a group? All of these are really valuable pieces of data, warm data, that can inform what might be going on. So we have the coach. Coach might look at the individual participants simultaneously what stage is the group at and there are different frameworks for that we could then look at what's the wider system in which all this work is happening what's going on in the ecology societally economically politically what are the market conditions and i hesitate but of course can say well, what is the impact of our pandemic at the moment what is the, the impact of, for instance, in the UK and Europe with Brexit, but that will have a global impact? What's going on with climate? And how does this impact on the coach themselves and their own approach and or the team that they're walking into and working with? So we have the wider system in which the individuals and the team are participating. So who is the leader in all of this? And is the leader just the leader by name or by title? Or is there a lot more going on psychologically with other layers, the explicit and the impact, uh, implicit leadership? 
and thus how do we contract and who are we contracting with now i'm aware i'm moving very quickly through this please stop me if i'm talking too much or too fast let's just pause for a second a second and, yeah. and, and, and then before we go into the others um, because it is a very complex environment um, uh, and of course, even if, if, there are layers of complexity with, within each one of these elements that you've identified. So uh, uh, within a team or group, to some extent, the ghosts of every other team that the members of this team have been in is present. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and all the way through, that there, there, there are the, the system, we're just seeing one layer of the system, really. Um, but... Um, uh, but say a little bit more, what would happen if the coach or coaches were not at the centre of this? Uh, or, or, or what is the rationale for keeping them there at the centre? Well, that's a lovely question because actually as we speak, you can see these shadowy arrows. And these shadowy arrows are to somehow create the, the, the sense that this is in constant motion. And I love that question. What if the coach isn't at the center? So if the coach moves out of the center, are they on the balcony looking in? Are they in the perimeter? If we're all sitting in a proverbial or literal or metaphorical circle, or is the coach coming to supervision and with me, say, as supervisor, sitting outside and saying, okay, well, we can look at you and your role in this, Mrs. Coach. What on earth else is going on there? So let's see what may be in your foreground that you're noticing and or what might the team be noticing? Because I, li I like that question if the coach isn't at the centre because the, you, one of the questions I think you were going to ask was how, how does the coach apply this? And in dialogue with a number of practitioners in different locations and different functions recently, we looked at the fact that some coaches might find this a really good checklist to say, what am I noticing or not noticing? And that's terrific and that's very useful. Then potentially, trainer of team coaches you yourselves may you and peter may be saying okay so as a team coach what might you be needing to pay attention to so you with the coaches can stand outside of this and say what might we pay attention to but the other interesting area that's come out of my conversations is to show this to the client and to show this to the team and say, listen, chaps, ladies and gentlemen, where are we looking? What is going awry? What is working? What is coming into? So engaging them in that dialogue to raise their awareness and I want to say compassionate appreciation for how they are showing up, how they are able to engage in this work and how they are able to commit to their team and or their leader and or to each other to develop and grow as a living organism that can deliver to whatever it is that the team is striving to achieve. So let Brilliant. me pause again. It, thank you, Alison. I, I have an image of my mind here of, um, uh, that, that, that takes this away from just a two-dimensional a two um, image that we have here. I have an image of a very large plastic ball and inside that very large plastic ball is a lot of other smaller balls and each one of these has, a, has one of these labels on it. And yeah. if you turn the ball, all the other balls are going to be turning round and some are going to be on the outside sometimes and then inside the position of each of them is going to be constantly changing. And somehow that, that, that I don't know if that works for you, but that seems yeah. to me to be a, a nice metaphor for what's actually happening here. We're in constant churn. I, lo I love that because that, that's, a, that's a really lovely metaphor. One, one that I has evolved for me is a, a pinball machine. Mm. So we have all of these balls pinging around against each other. And I think another one is a kaleidoscope. Mm. So you can, if you turn the kaleidoscope, the whole configuration and the relationships of each of these factors changes 
with each other and with the whole picture. So we're creating a different picture. Do you want to say something about the other, the other elements in the, in the map? Well, yeah, okay. So we got, let me go down here to your coaching framework and this might be something that's really significant. Um, what I'm finding with coaches at the moment as they're engaging in coach, team coach training is what is their own framework for how they're approaching this work? They may, their client may ask for team coaching and they say, yes, I do team coaching. And they're asked, well, what does your framework look like? Oh, well, what do you need, Mr. Client? Um, so there's something about the coach being clear about what are they trying to co-create with their client? What is the purpose that they're engaging in? What part and what form does coaching play? And how is it the same or different from individual coaching because many of their clients may have individual experience and therefore how do they name what is this practice for themselves and for their client of what team coaching might be so then i guess we can go on to something like collective intelligence and we've talked about the individual we've talked about the team we've talked about the wider system We've talked about the coach. So what part does the collective intelligence enable if we get everybody sharing their interactions, their knowledge, their relationships with each other? And how does that as a body of knowing and awareness enable the team to, to evolve, to change, to develop? So of course that can look then at the relationships that are going on. We walk in as team coach and everybody's smiling happily at each other or not happily at each other. And what's below the surface? What's the mask that each person brings when they come into an intervention like this? I'm the team coach, I'm a complete stranger. The boss has asked me to come in there. They may have enabled or I may insist on having one-to-one -one conversations with each of these people. How do I as coach be sensitive to, attuned to, notice what are the interrelationships that are going on, whether I'm there or not? And I think there's a lovely example of if we think there are eight people plus me in the room, there are 72 relationships just in the room, let alone the relationships that each and every one of those participants have with anybody outside of their room who may be impacting on how they're able to come. It could be their team members, it could be their, their other stakeholders, it could be what's going on in their family system, it could be going on with their customers. All of these are elements that may impact on how does the sales director relate to the finance director, relate to the ops director, given the individual demands, expectations, assumptions that each participant may have and you touched on the history either of previous groups they've been in and or with each other in the day job because you must have seen this the you know if there's been altercation or difference of opinion or i don't know the finance director or i don't know the sales director i don't can't be in a team with somebody i don't know and so how much time is given to actually getting to know each other because Often the urgency is, well, we've got a job to do, we've got goals to hit, we've got achievements to make, we better get on with the task. Why do we have to get to know each other? So for me, my bias is at the heart of the work is the relationship. And if we attend to the relationship, we'll get the job done. But that's my orientation with my, my own lenses that I'm holding here. So briefly then, let's have a look at Progress reviews, because of course we've we've looked at you know what's the purpose of the work in the contract, and this evolves and changes. But then, what progress are we making? And I think this is one of the most demanding areas for the coach who isn't on site constantly, because the moment that coach leaves the room, 
that that group of individuals goes off and does their own thing. They may meet collectively with or without the coach. How does the coach stay in touch with their efficacy, their potency, their contribution, and not try to take over or control it all and manage their own feeling of helplessness that they may not have control? So... Mm. And where are we going? What, what is the direction of travel? And that direction of travel can change from one session to another, unbeknownst to the coach. How does the coach be in touch with, but not have to spend hours catching up each time when they, when they come together? So then let's look at this other area that we have I've touched on briefly, the, what I call the psychological phenomena. And I don't think this can be underestimated. Um, and this doesn't mean that we um, have to be psychologists. I'm talking about how do we create safety and trust? How do we be mindful and acknowledge that there are issues around competition and power? Without again being a psychologist or a psychotherapist, people come into the room and have images or projections or assumptions about another or each other or indeed about the coach. And what, is, what does the coach pick up that the group projects onto them? What are the expectations? Are you going to fix us? Are you going to sort us? Are you going to tell us what to do? And how does the coach stay in coach mode and create safety and containment and not try to take over and hand the role to help the team members gain clarity in their role and their responsibilities. And that can take time because everybody comes in with preconditioning and with patterns already in place. So then I think the only other one I haven't touched on is the culture of the organization. And I think this is, this is, such a rich area that may sometimes get overlooked. If I come from, if I work, let me use me as an example, I work primarily in, in, the, in, the, in the commercial organizational world. I've had very, uh, I've had less experience say in the public sector or in, in, in the charity sector or in, um, I don't know, NGOs or something like that. So what, what am I there as the practitioner that do I need to be sensitive to, curious about? What can I learn? And there's something about being willing to be a learner as well as a coach in enabling and being sensitive to what are the patterns, what are the way this organization or this market sector may work that I may seek to question or be curious about or challenge that may be actually impacting on how the, how the, the work progresses. Yeah. I like to ask the question, what are the critical assumptions of the, of this, of the, in the culture of this organization? Um, yes. because, because those are what's going to affect everything else or one of the biggest influences. So, so Alison, it, 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 there's so much in this map. Um, it, it's, it, it's like team coaching itself. It's very hard to get one's head around all of it. Um, but in terms of, in practical terms of using this, uh, I, I've certainly found it helpful to be able to just step back uh, in, uh, in preparing for a, a coaching assignment or, or, or with somebody who's preparing for a coaching assignment, uh, just to say, well, what are we taking into account? What have we not, not noticed or not paid attention to? And then subsequently in reviewing it to do the same thing, well, what did we pay attention to and what should we have paid more attention to? Um, no. but, how, but how else would you would you see would that would that would that be a part of the, the process for you or, or what else would you see oh i certainly endorse that uh, david i think um it, it's it's it, and what i'm hearing you describe is that curiosity in preparation rather than i need to have a set i need to have a set agenda to go in mm. and potentially the, the coach has to have a sense of where they are and 
what what might they have missed last time or they might have had a conversation with the team leader or they may have picked something that they, if they're working in a dyad the dyad may have a conversation where is our attention as we're going in now where have we got to where might we offer a perspective here so i think it, it to me this is um uh what's the word it's it's uh, it's a a guide it's a I, I come back to the map it's where might we go now what where haven't we been yet which pathways haven't even occurred to us or to them and is that relevant or not and maybe yeah. it's not even relevant if it hasn't come in maybe it's not even relevant yet but certainly for me the I, I think what I'm finding through supervision is the coaches so often come in saying, I'm confused, uh, this is so messy, I don't know whether I'm being any use at all, um, they've changed their mind, uh, <laughs> uh, I thought we were going west and we're going north, or three people have left the organisation so it's a different team, do I start again? Um, the leader says he's a leader, but the feedback I'm getting from everybody is that he's not leading at all. But what do we do with him? Because he might be becoming yep. scapegoated by what's going on. And everybody's so relieved to blame the leader because it's not happening. And actually, as coach, how do we take it back to the individual contributors as co-creating what might have to happen? So, um, those are lovely examples, Alison. I'm drawn back to your metaphor of, of, of the trees in the forest. Uh, uh, and sometimes we, we can walk through a forest or we can stop and we can take a moment and we can look around us and we can see the interplay of shadow and light. Mm. Uh, um, and maybe that's one of the things that, we, we need, that this helps us to do. Oh, I love that, David, because as you said that... I've not done much forest walking, but I've been trekking. And as you talk about that, I, I, I mean, for me, trekking could be quite a metaphor in that on day one, we were going up and on day two, we were going down in the mountains. And some days I had to carry my own day pack. Other days, somebody helped me. Sometimes I walked with a colleague. Sometimes I was at the front of the group. Sometimes I was at the back of the group. And every now and again, I certainly needed to stop and take my boots off and rest and look back to where I'd been and just look up or look down to see where I might go next. And what help do I need to guide me because I don't I'm not the unique holder of the pathway and mm. actually all the members of the trekking party may have contributed and we certainly had guides and we had the Sherpa team and we had the map readers so it's it was very much a collective process and I think another interesting piece and I don't know if it's relevant is when one person got altitude sickness we all came down we didn't just all carry on and leave the poor person with altitude sickness to to head down on their own so there's something here about we're, we're on this we're on this collective co-created pathway together and we go at the pace that we can make sure everybody can stay together albeit spaced out at different paces at different times of the day or the or the process of the trekking so that's a, that's a lovely metaphor uh, Alison I guess the other one that, that comes to my mind here is the difference between being the coach or the team coach's technician and the team coach as the landscape artist. Oh, say some more about that. As with the technician, we're concentrating on the process. We're thinking, okay, so, so let's be intellectual about this. <clears throat> let's look at the culture here. Let's put a few, uh, let's have a diagnostic on the corporate culture or whatever. Oh, yes. But, but as, as the artist, we are, we are, we're noticing. 
we're seeing the way that the colors change over the, over the course of the day, for example. Yeah. Um, so there's a different quality of observation. Oh, that's, yes. Yes, that's, yes, I'm interrupting you, but that's gorgeous, actually, because the issue I have with this map is it is two-dimensional and it is static and how to create something, and I will develop it technologically somehow so that it can capture that sense of constant movement and constant change of colour and shape and shadow and tone and pace at the same time as what's my task today. And yeah. I really like your dis distinction between the, the technician and, and the artist. That's, I really like that, thank you. And, and maybe that's the way that we bring all this into life is that we, we have to be the technician some of the time, but if we can be the artist as well, and to actually, so we can look at the whole map through the eyes of, through those two separate um, eyes and sets of assumptions. Yeah, and that just brings me to one perhaps final point, David. I think what is really important is that these the folks coming into team coaching are not babies. They are highly skilled, highly experienced practitioners in diverse fields. Yes, they may have primarily maybe coaching skills but before they became coaches many of them and you must have found this have extensive experience and wisdom around groups around multicultural organizations around organizational development around human resources there's adult learning around relational psychology so I think it's really important that the practitioners don't diminish the breadth and depth of their experience and wisdom on which they are adding a, a number of additional skills or insights that enable them to transpose their coaching practice into this domain, but it doesn't diminish the wisdom and experience that they have already that informs so that they can look at a map like this and say, ah, yes, I'm, I'm comfy there, or I don't know much about that, or I'd love to know more about this. And of course they can add to the map themselves. It's not a fixed, it's, it's an evolving map, isn't it? So it just is. as you've constantly evolved it, they can bring their own experience and worldview into it. Yes, yes, I hope so. I hope so. And I think worldview is a really lovely word too, because this is, I want to say, this is bigger than just what's going on in the room. Yeah. Alison, thank you for a wonderful exposition of, of, uh, of what I think is a fascinating tool for team coaches. And, and uh, something that uh, gives us a, a sense of just what's, how complex the whole thing is. Um, but, a, but a way through too to make sure that we bring these things to mind and while we can never be aware of everything all at the same time um, to be able to be more aware than, uh, than, than we would normally be well, so, ha, ha, go on no, I was going to say how do people get in contact with you Alison too, if oh, they want to learn guess, more guess what David there, <laughs> there we go <laughs> Some, something I prepared earlier <laughs> 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 thank you so much for the question <laughs> <laughs> and thank you Alison for a lovely exposition of a, of a really valuable tool